right. Shabbat Shalom uh, to everyone and everyone who's joining us live here in the gathering and those who are watching by video. A uh, big welcome to you. We hope that your Shabbat is uh, very blessed wherever you are uh, in the world at this time. And uh, and for those who are still looking and uh, want to come and join us and say hi live during the live gathering, uh, just go to the rivershabbat.com website, scroll down, hit that subscribe button, and then uh, put in your email address, first and last name, hit subscribe, and that'll get you on the community list. And we send out the newsletter every week, which has a few various things in it but the main thing is uh the teaching for the upcoming shabbat and that will have the live link to use on your uh, zoom to come and join us so you're very welcome and we'd love to see you all right here we are um we are at uh the end of our journey with uh with micah and uh, the book of Micah, this great prophet given to the southern kingdom at the time uh, and the judgments that were uh, impending and that had occurred in Samaria. And then, of course, uh, Micah being given with Isaiah um, on the impending judgments coming to Jerusalem. So uh, in this whole incredible scenario, we had this divided kingdom with the uh, northern and southern kingdoms and uh, both had become uh, corrupted. And so the father sent in his prophets uh, to uh, ahead of time to be able to sound the alarm, to give the warnings of uh, of turning back to him and his ways um, as judgment uh, was going to be allowed to fall on the house for some of the things that they had allowed to uh, to creep in. And so we've been on quite a journey here. Has everybody enjoyed the journey on the book of Micah and what this great prophet has done? Yeah. Um, and so he's a lesson to us all uh, at this time. And I believe that this incredible book and what he faced, what he dealt with, um, the parallels to us as we come to the end of the age uh, are timeless. They're incredible. And we can learn and understand what was happening with the with the people, the uh, the servants of Yah that were sent in at that time. And I believe what is happening right now on the earth before uh the uh the second coming of messiah and uh, the end of this age uh, as a uh incredible part of his uh, great plan of redemption and so we've got a lot to consider i just want to put a quote up here warning to the people um this is john mcafee and uh, he'd started the uh, security uh, uh, computer uh programmer and whatnot um not that i uh um uh, a whole much esteem for uh, the man's personal life and and uh, and some of the things he did, but one of the things that um, that he would do, he was very outspoken on what he believed was coming. He said, "We are fast approaching an era where people versus the government becomes a worldwide phenomenon," and we are actually starting to see this play out. Um, he he died in uh, last year. Uh, many believe it was suspicious. Uh, in that he was very outspoken to what was going on uh, in the in the systems of the world. But, uh, you know, again, this is a thing where we we see Rome is getting a sense now that we are heading for um, calamity. And and so it's interesting as Rome is evaluating itself and going through this, it's understanding its own corruption, what is going on um, again, as we've been doing in the series here. Um, we have an incredible opportunity to be a light at this time. Um, in a sense, there's many people in Rome that are getting nervous. They're, they're starting to realize that something is coming upon the earth. And they, they don't necessarily have the hope and the spirit and the truth and the love of Messiah that we hold. And so, uh, and so they're without shalom, essentially, in, in this situation right now. And so uh, Rome is scrambling. You know, it's like the proverbial patient it's in its hospital bed it's uh it's dying the darkness is ascending and uh, we're seeing them all over the place at this time so we we look to something like the great prophet micah because we are instructed to by messiah and so we have done this in this journey and we looked at the transgression we talked about the time of evil you know what was the transgression of yaakov um and we look at this complicity that he was allowing um, certain things to creep into the house of Israel, you know, um, and what would become the house of Israel. And so 
this sort of thing uh, is important for us to understand that this is constantly, there's this mystery Babylon. She's always at the door um, and she's wanting to bring in a, uh, another way. And so uh, the father allows this in his infinite wisdom as it will ultimately test and sift his people and ultimately who loves him. And so we need to understand that we have a king on the throne and that uh, not, nothing's a shock to him. Nothing is a surprise in his great plan of redemption. He's outside the time domain and uh, we're the ones that are in it. And so as we go through this, we're to understand uh, his character, um, his, uh, you know, what that all brings about in this. And a part of that is judgment for the re purpose of repentance. And this is all a part of his mercy and his compassion. And so while we're going through uh, the journey we are as we come to the end of the age, something like the book of Micah is an incredible thing to revisit because he basically, as he goes through, he says these transgressions, they bring a time of evil. And he's he's referring, you know, just to the state of, you know, the, the uh, northern and particularly the southern kingdom uh, and what was coming in. And then one of the things he goes to is shame on the prophets, those who were supposed to warn of, of this kind of thing staying there and the judgment that would come. Uh, Micah was, um, you, you know, he could see the oppression of the poor. He could see these sorts of things of where he had come from. Uh, and he was literally going, you know, you, you're not doing your job. And so he was one of the servants of Yah that stepped up and said, listen, this is, you know, what's, what's happening over here in the Northern Kingdom. By the way, Southern Kingdom, it's coming for you too. If you don't understand and see what's happening here, then uh, and then he switches and then he goes into claiming the throne um, and this coming conquering king. Um, and uh, and then he goes into the prophecies of the suffering servant king. And so he's he's giving an insight to both the first and second coming of Messiah incredibly, you know, 700 years before the first coming of Messiah. So his understanding um, which was anchored in his appointed times, which was anchored in the spring and fall Moedim. He had an incredible understanding of this great plan of redemption. And, uh, and so he was speaking up. And so after he gone through the judgment, he's reminding people that, you know, part of this great plan is our king coming in these two stages. And then he gets into, um, starts to look at, well, righteous governance is going to come with this. Uh, and this sort of thing. And there's hints there to uh, even uh, bridal language to the bride of Messiah. And then he's finishing with this judgment, this compassion. And I've got here the repentance of Elohim. And this is, this is something we don't often think about as to who led the way truly when it comes to his encouragement for us to be in a place of repentance, Toshuva in the Greek metanoia. And so we're, we we sort of only think of repentance from our perspective, and yet that's not how uh, our Creator and, and Yah um, looks at this whole place of repentance. And partly because we don't understand often what repentance is, um, and in the true Hebraic sense, this uh, teshuva or teshuva is where you are turning. To something and what he's saying is turn to me in my ways so when you turn to something you're doing a 180 and you're actually turning and coming face to face or panim panim with whatever it is that is requiring this repentance and so there's a very interesting thing that that how uh, micah finishes up and uh, goes through this uh you know what we have as a chapter seven of course the book of micah was all one book instead of writings but we've broken it down um, as it's given to us in our modern sort of Tanakh uh, structure. And, uh, and so in this final chapter, this chapter seven, there's incredible things. So um, what we looked at last week was this, you know, hear the rod and him who appointed it. And we looked at sort of the various levels uh, of this, that right ruling is coming for all the nations. And they are going to teach us his ways, and they're going to walk in his path. And he's going to establish something during this final age of his great plan of redemption to actually bring this about. And I always kind of flippantly say, you know, we're, we're looking at the raising of the eternal family. But he doesn't plan on doing this alone. He plans to have uh, something with him that is administering this last and final age, that he's going to have a bridal governance that is doing this um, to serve his great purpose before we get to the great white throne. And 
course, um, Micah was very well aware of that. But so was uh, Isaiah. And Isaiah, you know, um, puts it in language or in terms of this last uh, final great age in terms of discipleship. We are going to see a thousand years of essentially bridal discipleship occurring on the earth. And this is this language of turning, you know, their swords and this these people and these worlds and nations that had learned war and they're going to be turned into plowshares uh, and the spears are going to be turned into pruning hooks. And this is all discipleship language. This is all about getting back. And so that we will learn war no more, we will actually learn his ways through this. So we have this incredible period of discipleship coming with this bridal governance. And of course, the great prophets were all aware of this. They knew and understood this, despite uh, a lot of uh, what I believe to be quite silly, um, you know, uh, doctrinal uh, perspectives when it comes to understanding the uh, this last great age and this plan of redemption before um, all things are made new and uh, we're back out of the time domain and into an eternal perspective. So then... Uh, the the administrating of this and where we finished up last week was to look and say there is a uh, a royal scepter and the challenge here was that I believe this to be his bridal governance and how she will go about doing this is the mashna the support the shepherding staff uh, the mate um, you know the stick this rod to deliver and the makal and the rod the staff the branch the guiding and all of these are the functions of governance of the shavet. Um, of this royal scepter. And of course, the giver of this, really interestingly enough, is the Chotar, or, or the Nessa, uh, and that is uh, Yeshua Messiah himself. So he's this, uh, this uh, Netzer that, that springs forth uh, from the promise uh, uh, of the lineage of King David is going to come forth, and, uh, and this Netzer is going to wield his scepter, his governance, during this great time, and it's going to go forth in these various ways that we see described throughout scripture. So it's really quite incredible if we have ears to hear and eyes to see. And then we looked, of course, at the big questions where we finished up to really go, what is uh, the point of all of this? And of course, if we don't have any say in being born and in being born fallen and in dying, and we don't justify or save anyone and our blood isn't achieving any of that, and we don't circumcise anyone's heart, you get to the point of what is the meaning of your life? And what is this really about? And so we need to really then go and trust in the great plan of redemption and to understand it. And I believe the prophet Micah uh, really understood this, uh, as did all the prophets. And, um, and so we need to really put back into perspective, well, then what is our part in all of this? And this is where we understand this uh, great thing of teshuvah and repentance. So the overview of this book, so we look at the transgression of Jacob, this complicit allowing spiritual adultery into the house. And then this look at this corruption and oppression and uh, um, oppression to flourish when his people are not in repentance, is, it, it stops that flourishing. And so Mike is addressing all of this. And then to be a set apart nation, it can only be attained when we get this uh, spiritual adultery out of the house. Um, and so the prophets need to do their job job and then Elohim he uh the Elohim we serve he is set apart he is the standard of righteousness and holiness and so when we're in the places that Micah was warning about indeed with the other contemporary prophets at the time in the northern kingdom Hosea and Amos and then of course with himself and Isaiah to the southern kingdom judgment will come without that teshuvah without that place of repentance Yah does not tolerate in his character continue rebellion and violence against his covenant and we are to guard the moedim we are to guard the weekly sabbath we are to guard his moedim we are not to allow violence to come into them this is not a time to make it about us it's not a time to settle your disputes and your arguments and and tax silly it's not a time to go and create divisive arguments you know some of the stuff we see at the appointed times over the years it's just grieved me we are to guard these things. They're not our appointed times. They are his. And when we don't guard this against violence to it, we, we grieve the Ruach, essentially, uh, in all of this. And so this was a, this was a command. Honoring it is what we're going to struggle with. And we got to learn and we got to understand um, so that we don't miss the mark. But the commandment to guard it was very character and behavioral based. And so this is very important. 
Um, Yah's word intended to work good, to bring repentance and ultimately the hope of his promise. Okay, so this is where Micah knew this whole sense. And then Yah is merciful and willing to forgive and to turn back to us. And of course, to understand that nature of why repentance or teshuva is so important as a part of this great plan of redemption. So the house of Israel spiritually, we have liars, we have cheats, we have adulterers. Think of this in spiritual terms. We're lying spiritually. We're trying to cheat things spiritually. We're in spiritual adultery. Uh, we are fornicating. We're all over the place. Many of you, you know, if, you're, if we're honest with our testimonies, we've been all over the place in our religious journeys. <laughs> and so this is, this is what's actually in the houses. We try to sit this out. We do have murderers. We, we're hating our brothers and our sisters and whatnot. This is all speaking to the spiritual heart level. Uh, we have homosexual well, of course, what the great warning or typology given to us in scripture is the woman is called Mystery Babylon. And if we are the bride of Messiah, then we are essentially in a spiritually homosexual relationship as we do all of this. So it's a very serious uh, um, uh, analogy that the, the father has given to us in his word. And uh, we're not to water this down. He gave a graphic um shadow picture for us to understand this so that it would simply get through our thick skulls that we'd understand we're not here to water this down and in fact we were to instruct the children would learn in the ancient Hebraic culture they would learn these things between the ages of six to 12 years old as a part of their standard education and here we are watering everything down and we don't have anywhere near what an adult should be at 13 years old um, we're lucky to have adults at 40 years old now you know, and even then we don't. It, it's just we're in real terrible shape at this point. Um, so we have the disobedient, the, the idolaters in the house. Uh, we're cowardly spiritually as, as a result of this. Uh, sometimes we see the greed that has crept into uh, the systems, the spiritual systems. We have those who are violent to his Moedim, and they're not guarding it. Uh, and we uh, think we can just act however we want on these Moedim, and we have no consideration that we are stealing the shalom, that they are there for us to understand. Um, and then, of course, we can become covetous uh, within our, in our prideful existence. We get a little bit of knowledge, and suddenly, you know, we want to go throw our self-righteousness in everyone's face. And, uh, and then uh, we become, you know, that prideful lovers of self. And so when you think of this, we end up in this prideful place spiritually. And of course, this happened to the adversary. Uh, ultimately, we don't know how long it took <laughs> from a time domain perspective, but this did happen. And so we think we're all so good and actually we're not in a very good place. And so it all comes down to self-righteousness. And then we don't bring forth his righteousness, we bring forth our self-righteousness and we're doing this spiritually. And so when we get into this place of walking our faith out and not seeing uh, our need for repentance and looking in our own house, then we start to be in this self-righteous place. We can no longer see what we truly look like to a holy Elohim. And, uh, and then we start to create, uh, we start to um, uh, hurt each other, uh, basically. It doesn't matter what the, the intention is. We can have the best of intent. It does not mean that we're, we're not hurting each other and bringing grief to his Holy Spirit, his Ruach. So judgment is coming. We see in uh, Devarim in Deuteronomy in the Torah in 2863, 64. I'm just going to read here. And Yah took delight in doing you good and multiplying you. So Yah will take delight in bringing ruin upon you. So this is to do with the blessings of the curse is clearly stated uh, in these incredible um, parts of the Torah. And you shall be plucked off the land that you're entering in to take possession of. So they're going in to take the problem and he's telling them at a time, you're going to be plucked off this. And of course, we would see this with the impending judgments that would be allowed by Elohim because of the idolatry, spiritual adultery that was in the house. And Yah will scatter you among the peoples. So he's saying, for this, I'm going to scatter you from what? One end of the earth to the other. Wow. So this was all being stated up front by him. And they shall serve other gods of wood and of stone, which neither your fathers have known. And of course, this actually took place. And of course, the great uh, prophets, Micah being one of them, was in there before these uh, judgments would come down on the northern and southern kingdoms. Not obeying his ways. 
And in 2 Kings 17, 13 here, of course, more um, uh, relating to the time of, of Micah and particularly um, uh, uh, in the Northern Kingdom. Uh, yet, um, Yah warned Israel and Judah. So he's speaking to both by every prophet and every seer saying. So he's saying through my prophets, I sent my prophets before these things would occur. And we know that this is what scripture says. It says this, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments. So you're partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but it's starting to become all evil. And, and Mike is going to address this. Um, keep my commandment, my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the Torah that I've commanded your fathers, that I have sent you uh, by my servants, the prophets. And so Yah's not just leaving it a surprise. He's well ahead of time giving this chance of, uh, of repentance. And of course, we're all getting this opportunity as we come to the end of the age, as he wakes up his people to do exactly the same thing. All of us here are in a place of teshuva. We're getting over ourselves. We're looking in our own houses. We're going, maybe I don't look as good as I think. Well, I need to repent. We need to look at these things. And so, um, so at this time, the true prophets, the true uh, um, Navi, uh, the ones who will bring the fruit met for repentance, they, uh, and they'll bring forth this fruit of their lips, it will bear good fruit um, if we turn into this uh, turn to him and his ways again at this time. Second Kings 17, 18, 20 says something interesting here, furthermore, addressing at this uh, interesting time for the kingdom, uh, the northern and southern kingdoms of the house of Israel. It says, therefore, Yah was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only. So, of course, we saw Samaria being uh, judged and everything else. But Judah, look at this. Judah's not off the hook. Judah also did not keep the commandments. And of Yah, their Elohim, and walked in the customs that Israel had introduced. Now, this is a big thing. Even though they are going to continue to remain in authority at this stage, they're being infected. But somebody is needed to have this in place or be able to put it in place until what would become the first coming of Messiah to when he would actually take uh, the, the scepter, uh, from Judah as well. So Judah's in trouble here too, but they've got a sort of a babysitting role as best they can, but they're bringing in sorts, sorts of interesting customs and traditions into the house. And Yah rejected all the descendants of Israel. So he's rejecting all of it. Uh, and in fact, in Amos, it gets very strong. You know, I hate your Moedim, your appointed times. You've turned them into yours, not mine, and afflicted them and gave them the hand of the plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. So there's in very particular what had come in that it was influencing both the northern and southern kingdom. We talked about this earlier in the book was the particular missing of the mark that related to ball worship and the spiritual adultery that came with it. So uh, very interesting how when I look at the landscape uh, of the faith and I look at either side of the river, if I look at the Christian side or I look at the modern Judeo, Messianic Hebrew roots, I am seeing a lot of things that should not be here. And we're in this right now, and we should take note uh, at this time why he was not pleased with what had crept in, whether it be actual Baal worship, whether it be traditions of men that were taken away from the actual Torah, all of these sorts of things. And so we need to be very, very, very um, diligent at this time to know that as we come to the end of this age, and as his final judgments come upon the earth, we want to come out of her, my people. And so this is a, a challenge to all of us. So what is Yah to do? What's he to do with all of this? What's going on? You know, we, we, you know, he's sending his prophets. He's wanting his people to, uh, to, to operate in his covenant and in his ways. He's, you know, he's saying, you're not doing that. Um, you, you're, you're spiritually whoring all over the place. You're bringing things into the house that shouldn't be there. And you've got all of these things going on. So what does this mean for us uh, today? And so I'm going to just jump to the Brit Hadashah here in the New Testament. And Luke 17, 3, 4 says this, pay attention yourselves. So what they are dealing with here, uh, following Messiah, is they are dealing with very uh, serious things. And what would come into uh, what has been essentially the last two days or the, uh, the last almost 2,000 years. Pay attention to yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him. 
and if he repents, forgive him. Now, this can be, uh, this is talking about personal sin. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take quickly a look at something of how we're to deal with whole matters of sinning uh, against each other and how we're to actually view this because our physical shadow picture right now in how we live out our faith um, lets us understand the greater plan of redemption. And I'm going to show you why. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent. So they're turning to that brother or that sister. You must forgive him. Now, this is interesting. What's going on here? Because it denotes here an action on both the party that has had a transgression of sin against them, but also to the one who has done it. So this is very interesting. There's two players in a certain picture. Uh, why is this? It says this in Colossians 3, 12 to 13. Put on then as Elohim's chosen one. So there's real bridal speak here. I believe the bride is going to go somewhere in a heart circumcision level that many may not. Listen carefully, River Shabbat community on this this is very careful for us to understand the chosen ones there and it is the father who chooses the bride of messiah this governance i believe will go to a set apart place because the compassion of hearts the kindness the humility the meekness and the patience is the result of a circumcised heart there is something that is going to happen to his bridal governance. It's going to be able to rise above their pride, their idolatry, all of their uh, issue, their covetousness, their lying, everything else that's going on. So as people of Israel and, 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 uh, and our creator, Elohim, we are to understand this. Us. Pay attention. Is what we see recorded in Luke. Bearing with one another, if one has a complaint against the other, forgiving each other as Yah has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. One of the greatest things that will shut down the work of the Ruach in your life and heart circumcision will be unforgiveness. It will absolutely shut it down and it grieves the Spirit of God. So why such a thing, I believe, being put towards or the challenge to those who would be the bride of Messiah? Not just justified by the blood of Messiah, actually going to a place where he can use and be a part of a ruling governance in the age to come. I'll make this very clear. And I've got forgiveness versus restoration. We get this confused. So I'm just going to do this because this is leading in to something that Yah is going to do for all of us. Forgiveness is given on the part of the offended for the offense. This is the requirement of what you are seeing in the understanding that came through, the understanding of the spirit and the truth that we see recorded in the Brit Hadashah. Forgiveness is not dependent on the guilty seeking forgiveness uh, for the offender. This gets very confused. We're often going, well, you know, I'll forgive them if, you know, they come and say sorry or something like this. Seeking repentance is not saying sorry. Repentance is actually turning to that which you offended. Forgiveness sets the offended free. This is what it's doing. It's allowing you to be in a place to go ahead with your faith, to go ahead and continue your journey, to do these sorts of things from the offense that may have incurred. And many of you have experienced true offense in your life from someone. So what are we to do? Are we just to be doormats? Is that what this is about? No. If the offended forgives, it does not mean that the offendant agrees big thing or think that it was somehow okay what the guilty did to them because you are finding forgiveness you're allowing your heart to be circumcised does not mean you're saying it is okay what occurred to you true restoration cannot occur all right in this situation though now think about this e even if you've prepared a heart for forgiveness if someone does not turn to you, that has hurt you, that has offended you, that has done this wrong to you, 
you cannot have restoration. Let's not confuse your ability to find forgiveness for something that has been wrong to you with restoration. And this is often what people think. Restoration occurs when there are two parties involved. If the guilty seeks and asks for forgiveness from the offended, this is repentance. They are turning to them. They're not just sorry for their actions. They truly want to know. They truly understand the offense that they have done and how can they write it? What action can they take to demonstrate the actual repentance? Now there's something interesting going on here. If the offended is truly forgiven the offense at this point, then the guilty have a chance. I've got to change here for restoration. In other words, this act of a heart that is prepared and a person who understands the offense, that forgiveness is there. And now Teshuva enters the picture and they are turned one to another. You have a chance at restoration. There are many times when you may find forgiveness what was done to you and the person who offended you may never go into a place of repentance. You're not to live your life imprisoned by that emotion. And this is what it's saying. Do not do this. Have your heart prepared because if this person does come to you in true repentance and talking about, you know, teshuva, metanoia, repentance is a whole other teaching because you need to understand what does repentance look like? Well, what repentance looks like is decided by the offended. You don't get to decide what repentance looks like. You turn to that person. I acknowledge that I've wronged you. What must I do? But if you're not in a place where you've prepared your heart to receive that, you will be held to account by Elohim why there is not restoration. Now, isn't that sobering? Think how sobering that really is. So if somebody is turning to you and they really are in a place of repentance and they really are looking for what must I do? to make this right, to show you that I'm in. And they're allowing the offended to decide what that is. And you turn them away? We're in trouble. Ready your heart. In Ephesians 4, uh, 30 to 32 here, in this incredible book uh, to the Ephesians, um, I believe written by the Apostle Paul, no doubt. He says this. I do not grieve the Holy Spirit of Elohim, the Ruach of Elohim, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So he says, I'm not going to grieve this. Look what leads to the grid, the what leads to grieving the Spirit of God on our lives, which is absolutely the essential component of heart circumcision. The Ruach is like the surgeon doing this on your heart. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. If you're not in a place of forgiveness, you will engage in Lashon Hara and you will hurt and damage the body. No wonder it grieves him. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Elohim in Messiah forgave you. Interesting. Do we just take this lightly? Oh, yes, you know, he died for my sins. Do we really understand what the plan of redemption really means? Do we really understand Yah's repentance in all of this? We're going to look at we're going to look at this uh, a little bit more. We're going to go through the final chapter. Who's got their Bibles? Okay, let's get that out. Nice. All right. Micah st starts off here. So beginning in chapter seven, it says, woe to me. For I am as a gathering of the summer fruit and as the gleanings of the grape harvest. This is very interesting. Makes him be one to take in two ways. The gleaning being uh, a remnant of that crop or the gleaning being um, uh, in, in a more um, uh, um, doing harm. To the situation it says there there is no cluster to eat 
So he's saying, woe to me. I think he's defining how we're to look at the re- root word of gleaning there in the Greek. So this is interesting. He's not stating this here. He's not looking at himself as I'm all good. Now, this is the prophet Micah sent by the father at this time to warn the house of Israel. And this man, this servant of Elohim does not see himself of anything but in need of the very thing he's telling the people there in the southern kingdom to repent of. So he's not putting himself above the very people he's warning. Look at this. The loving committed one has perished from the earth. He's looking at the situation and he's going, wow, we have few that love our Elohim. And there's no one straight among men. Oh, we don't get to just look at the Roman politicians in Rome and everyone else that's struggling with the darkness. This is talking about the house of Israel. All of them lie in wait for blood. Everyone hunts his brother with a net. The behavior that's going on here is destructive to the body. Both hands are on evil. Look at what they say. So you're participating, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know what he's saying? You're only just eating evil now. Wow. To do it well, the prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe. And the great man speaks the desire of his being. Very prideful. Very corrupt. All in the house. And they weave it together. So it's all a part of the tapestry of trying to, uh, to be uh, the house of Israel. The best of them is like a prickly plant. The best of them. So a prickly plant. Okay, maybe it doesn't do too much damage, but you'll be saying, ouch. The most straight is sharper than a thorn hedge. The most straight. A thorn hedge. That'll cut you. That'll hurt you. Even the ones that are sort of doing better than others are still going to hurt you now. Boy, do I see this all over the body right now. The day of your watchman and your punishment has come. Now is there confusion. Something's going to, is something right now on earth is happening to the house of Israel. And many are going, wait a minute, how am I to look at this? Maybe we're not in the place we should be. Trust, look at this, trust no friend, rely on no companion, guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. I believe that's a direct statement of Mystery Babylon. For the son is despising father and daughter rises up against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What an end time shadow picture here. The enemies. The man are the men of his own house. Wow. Within the family nucleus of the believing family nucleus, this is where the enemies truly lie, and it is us. It is the mirror. As for me, this is what Micah says, as for me, I look to you I wait for the Elohim of my deliverance. So now he's putting, I haven't put myself above everyone. Woe is me, is how he starts this. I've not put myself above the very thing that I'm addressing, acknowledging. But he's saying, as for me, I'm going to have faith and understanding of uh, of the promises of his appointed times, of his plan of redemption. My Elohim does hear me. So there's a righteous man here that is coming forth and his prayers are being heard and they will accomplish much. And what he's been asked to do here, do not rejoice over me, oh, my enemy. So in other words, (laughs) you're you're gonna have a go at me when this supposedly doesn't go so well for me. When I have fallen, I have risen. He knows the whole plan of redemption. And he's making a direct statement there to something very interesting. So he speaks of, I'm going to go to Sheol. Oh, you can rejoice over that, but I know I'll be risen. When I sit in darkness, the darkness of Sheol, 
Yah is the light to me. I bear the displeasure of Yah, for I have sinned against him. Until he pleads my case. Wow. Until he pleads my case. Allusion here now to a high priest. And shall execute right ruling for me until he brings me out into the light and I look on his righteousness. Quite possibly, Micah was included in the first of the first fruits and the 24 elders that John saw on the island of Patmos. Incredible. He may have been raised with Messiah. Put it this way, I won't be surprised if the prophet Mike is one of the 24 elders. And let my enemy see it. And let shame cover, cover her who said to me, look at this, where is Yah your Elohim? And it's interesting how we see the same thing coming to the end of this age. Where is the promise of the coming of your Messiah? Nothing new under the sun. Let my eyes look on her. Now she is trampled down like mud in the streets. Mystery Babylon. Her destruction will come and the beast will devour her. If you understand what is written in Revelation. All Mystery Babylon has been riding the beast. But the beast is going to turn on her and devour her. Come out of her, my people. Do we wish to be devoured by the beast system? It's coming. Oh, how sobering judgment is. The day for building your walls. This is interesting. He immediately now goes into the last, the last age. The thousand year reign of Messiah. That's what he says. The day for building your walls, let the Torah go forth and wide in that day. Wow. The governance of Messiah on earth. We're going to look at a scripture there. That day when they come to you from Assyria, sure, and besiege cities of Mitzarim, Egypt, from the siege to the river and from sea to sea and mountain to mountain, i.e. all the nations are going to come to him during this time but the earth will become a waste because of those who dwell in it and for the fruit of their deeds man we are living this right now it's happening in front of our very eyes shepherd your people with your rod whoa there it is that's sir the Hotar, shepherd with your rod, your royal scepter, and let it go forth. Very bridal language. The flock of your inheritance who dwell alone in a forest or in the midst of Carmel. There's very spiritual talk that's going on here. Let them feed in Bashan. Bashan meaning fruitful. Let them eat of the fruit. And Gilead. This was the rocky places. This is, uh, was known also for a place of healings, the minerals and things, as in the days of old. In other words, return back. You don't have a corrupted spirituality in the whole scene we saw in Mount Carmel. It's come right. It is, it is right. It is good. There will be fruit to partake of. There will be the healing of the nations. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I shall let him see wonders. And of course, that great shadow picture of the Exodus. Let the nation see and be ashamed of all their might and let them put their hand over their mouth and let their ears be deaf. The sheep and goats judgments, the nation's judgments. Let them lick the dust like a serpent. Let them come trembling from their strongholds like snakes of the earth. Where did they go? They went to hide themselves in the rocks. I believe you're reading a description of the wrath of Elohim. Let them be afraid of Yah, our Elohim, and fear because of you. Who 
is an L like you? Who is an Elohim like you? Taking away crookedness and passing over this illusion to the fulfillment of the Pesach, the Passover, over the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. He shall not retain his wrath forever, for he himself delights in loving commitment. Look at this. He shall turn back. That's a statement of repentance of the creator. We're going to look at this. He shall turn back. He shall have compassion on us. How is he going to turn back? What does this look like? He shall trample upon our crookedness. And you throw all your sins into the depths of the sea. And you give truth to Yaakov, loving commitment to Abraham, which you swore to our fathers from the days of old. This is an incredible listing or allusion to him understanding the fulfillment of the fall Moedim. And it's all being listed out. And, and the spring Moedim. He is listing out this whole plan of redemption as he finishes off here the book of Micah. How did he have such insight, understanding, and knowledge, and a hope of his promise? Because he knew exactly how he was to look at true Bible prophecy and to understand the plan of redemption of Messiah. So, who will you trust? In Matthew 10, 21, we're coming into some interesting times here. Brother will deliver brother over to death. Now, this is very much reply at the time that this was written as well in the disciples. And the father is child, and the child will rise against his parents and have them put to death. What? This is in our own households. We're not serving him. We're serving man. Who are you going to trust? The one who is serving man or the one who is truly in repentance? We're living in that time. Now to understand the difference, you're going to put your trust in someone who's playing mystery Babylon. Trust, it is not earned. It is not to be given lightly. And we are not to do this in all matters of our lives. Why is trust the thing that creates the greatest offense? It does not allow the forgiveness because it has been broken. And when trust has been broken, to find that place of forgiveness is one of the most difficult journeys of the heart circumcision there is. And yet we have an Elohim that is saying, you broke my trust. Look in the mirror. You're looking at someone who broke his trust. By the way, I'm saying this to me. I look in the mirror and I see something in the flesh standing there that broke his trust. Trust is learned. And without a chance of repentance, where the parties are turning to each other, it will not allow for restoration. And you do not have fellowship without that chance of restoration. And therefore, you can never learn to trust that which you do not have restoration with and fellowship with. Look at this in Luke 12, 51, 53. Do you think I've come? to give shalom on the earth. No, I tell you, but rather division. Why? Because his truth is going to now come in to those who are not in repentance. From now on in one house, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. Many of you are experiencing this right now with your spiritual journey. And it's difficult. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. And mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. And daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. We are seeing this all over the body right now. And the persecution is coming from those who supposedly have a faith. Rome is now in this darkness ascending, knowing that they're in trouble. They're starting to tremble. 
And yet we see the so-called believers now all pointing the finger at themselves in their own household or losing their faith altogether. Judgment comes. It's coming. We need to understand the beautiful plan of redemption, but we also need to understand what must come forth in the fulfillment of these fall modems for this great and last final age. In Psalm 2, 1 to 6, it says this, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yah and his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away the cords from us. In other words, let us get rid of the very people gathering here today. We don't want what they have. We don't want Elohim in his ways and his truth. Let us cast these aside. And in doing so, they're collapsing in front of our very eyes. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Yah holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath. Again, we're in a fulfillment of the fall Moedim. They're going to experience the wrath of Elohim and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Oh, boy, there is something serious coming in the fulfillment of these fall Moedim as we come to the end of the age. And all these politicians and all these kings and rulers and all the ones, the snakes that hid themselves in the earth. They're going to face the wrath of Elohim. And Yah is literally not laughing in funny joy. Laughing at the reality that you can't save yourself. He's going to hold them in absolute terror and derision during his wrath. In Revelation 6, 14, 17, we see an interesting description here, I believe, of the wrath of Elohim. Again, it concurs with the Psalms. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and every slay and freed hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains. So scared about this is all real and the creator is now directly intervening in such a way it is terrifying who the generals the rich the powerful the kings of the earth this is their fate calling to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face the one who is now turning with his wrath to them Whoa. He's about to share his offense. Who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Make no mistake who this is. It's the King. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? In other words, get this who will not be able to repent? That statement right there, every knee shall bow. There is no atheism. There is no doctrinal arguments. There is nothing going down on the earth at this time. He is here. He is turned in his wrath upon the earth. It's over. And you know what he's saying there in that rhetorical question, who can stand? Who will not repent at this point? The scales and the balances of judges. In ancient biblical times, scales and balances were used in the weighing of the substance. Yah demanded that these be used justly. So there was all sorts of things going on here. And this is where we get shekel that would eventually turn into a monetary value. But the balance was an international symbol of justice that's come about in the sort of modern times, representing, you know, um, the supposed, you know, equality before the law. And we still have this as our symbols and these sorts of things, you know, this balance of justice. What was justice to Yah? In ancient times, the value or the quantity of a thing was determined. What? 
was determined by weighing it on the scales. True justice, and this is why yeah, it commands this. And, and, and so you've got this whole thing. And so people would bring and they sold items by weight or measure rather than kind of our modern currency-based systems and certainly our digital systems now. There is no justice. There is no balance of scales. It's all gone. And so they would use the shekel. They would create the weight of the shekel and they would try and cheat those. They would try and cheat the actual scales themselves. So the scales were easily manipulated and could be used for fraudulent, okay, extraction and oppression. And so indeed, Micah was witnessing this. In the house of Israel, you are cheating people out of their livelihood. I can tell you, Rome's been engaged to this in a major way right now. In terms of foodstuffs, particularly bread and the scales became a symbol. All right. So this became a symbol because the bread was sold normally by, by uh, a loaf and not the concern of the weight. However, during times of famine, which is one of the major things that's going to be allowed. As we actually experience this great tribulation, where suddenly food is going to become scarce. And in this point, in this time, you know, and I've got here, note, the, in the, in the seals in Revelation, the third seal in Revelation, the black horse and rider, where inflation is going to be absolutely out of control. And there'll be major oppression. And in that, you're in an unjust system. So not only is it going to take the fact that this has gone scarce, you're going to have a further oppression put upon it because of the very systems you are running, which are unjust scales. i will read to you out of the Torah here in Leviticus 19, uh, 35 to 37. You shall do no wrong judgment in measures of length of weight or quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights, and a just ephah. Remember that on the ephah. And just hin. This was a measuring generally around liquids. I am your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Again, referring to the Exodus. I'm that one. And I don't want you playing with this stuff in our own house. And you shall observe all my statues, all my rules, i.e. the Torah, and do them. I am Yah. Now, he knows they're going to fail to that. But he's still saying, guard my Moedim, even if you're going to fail. He knows they're going to fail. Very, very interesting. We see this whole just way, and we know the famous account that's being given in the negative, in the sense that Yah's handing it out. And, you know, we got Belshazzar and the Daniel account and the writings on the wall. And it's literally going, you have been weighed in the balance. Yah is weighing this situation in the balance. And they have been found wanting. They've been playing with the set-apart instruments and profaning the holy. Let me show you something here. It goes to say this in Leviticus 23, 16. You shall count 50 days. So this is now referring on the counting of the Omar up to Shavuot. And on the seventh Sabbath, then they shall present a grain offering of new grain to you. So there's going to be an offering. So the whole shadow picture of this is a grain offering coming, but it's a new grain. I'm going to suggest to you a repentant grain. And that's why we saw those people honoring Shavuot, even though there was no way back to their understanding at this time. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread. Interesting representation of the stones. The covenant. To be waved. Now look at this. A lot of people will miss this. Made of two tenths of an ephah. Now one of the things back Leviticus is you're not going to play with the measurements of the ephah. They shall be a fine flour, i.e. sifted. This is how I want. I want these, these loaves, these two, I want it sifted. I want this new grain to be sifted. I want this to be in a place of repentance. And they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to Yah, the leaven from heaven. They will literally have the right stuff now that is in the house. There was an interesting answer that is often missed here, and I've got the hidden ephah answer that that our Messiah Yeshua did when he was facing matters of the covenant, being questioned by the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. He says this, and one of the scribes came up and he heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? 
Now listen how Yeshua answers. The most important is here, O Israel, Yah our Elohim is one. Now he's referring to the Torah in Deuteronomy 6. This is interesting. You shall love your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and all your might and all your strength. Do you know that he is quoting the first four components for us to be in a place of repentance to the covenant? The actual, what we call the Ten Commandments or the Ten Matters and whatnot of the covenant, he directly, and this is what Devarim is pointing to, is directly, you will be in repentance to Elohim and only Elohim. This is how he's answering. The second of these is love your neighbor as yourself. And the rest of the covenant is all how we behave with each other, repent to one another, how we are to treat one another. Now, this is interesting. His answer was two-tenths of an ephah. If you don't know how he's answering, now they may have. I'm not sure whether they got this. But this ephah, two-tenths of an ephah, Two tenths, ten matters. Do you know that Messiah was directly answering to you are unjustly, without balance and without justice, administering not only your questions to me, but what you are doing to the house of Israel. And he's directly answering to the Torah and Leviticus. He's given, he has summed up the ten matters in two tenths of it and brought them all together as an ephah, a vessel that will hold the very wheat that will be sifted. Did they understand his answer to this level? I don't know. Probably not. But it is incredible that he was actually answering in that Levitical sense, in its true meaning. You are unjust in everything you are doing. And it is directly related to the covenant. You are doing violence against it in your injustice. In Proverbs 11, one says this, a false balance is an abomination to Yah. Very strong language being used here, rarely used in relationship to Yah. A false balance. Why so important on this balance? What does this balance represent? But a just weight is his delight. He delights in this happening the right way. What is Yah's picture in all this? Weighed in the balance, a pair of scales. Translated in the Greek, the word that is a gone, which literally means as a yoke of the ox and the yoke of bondage, the beam of a balance. So this cross beam that Yeshua was carrying, representing, because you would have this connect the two oxen. Literally, these two representations of the Aleph with this cross beam that he's holding. And you have to balance this thing to get to that stake or that, you know, made of the olive tree, put in the ground in order that they would be married and lifted up in the ancient Tav, which is contained and seen. And the olive and the Tav in the ancient Paleo-Hebrew is a cross. Make no mistake what this is. And so you have this rep representation of father and son, Elohim, heading for something as a just balance. Just as better. If the yoke oxen are evenly matched, whoa, just the right measure for the justice. Elohim has taken this on himself. I'll make no mistake what the olive is representing here and why that was a crossbeam he was carrying to that ancient stake or tree and it would be married and then lifted up. When the glories declare as heaven, as it says in 19.1, and they proclaim the work of his hands, his hands, what Yah has decided in all of this. Again, I can't help but point out the Mozanaim, we, you know, the modern sort of, um, uh, in the modern uh, Zodiac, you know, distorted versions, Babylon versions, we'd think of it as Libra, but there is an interesting picture in the Maserot of this beautiful plan of redemption that um, I believe the, the early Hebrews, and we found some of the mosaics that were actually done by the early church um, being uncovered in Jerusalem. And it's interesting. There's a set of scales there. There is a set of scales in the heavens as they would see it or relate to it anyway in their interpretation of the heavenlies.
you're looking at a blood red moon that occurred at the time of Passover in Jerusalem in 32 AD when the skies went dark. This is interesting because this is the exact day that our Messiah was put onto the ancient tough. And the blood red moon that had actually occurred where it was occurring in the Mazar Road was exactly at the point of this balanced scale. If you believe this to be a coincidence, you're welcome to it. But I believe that the heavens declare his glory and it means it. The balance scales, the justice occurred and the heavens were declaring it. Yah's repentance, what did he really endure? What was this about? The ancient Tav, he turned. And Micah knew this. Yeah, I was going to repent because you had no choice to participate in this time to me. He is going to take this full accountability, responsibility, and consequence. Yeshua is Yah's repentance. And as he was lifted up, he turned. And that forgiveness was being given. And now the restoration of the house of Israel is allowed for all of us. Yeshua is the repentance of God. He turned to his creation. If we could only see what that repentance looked like, his panim panim occurring on the ancient top. How could it not bring us to our knees? What does the repentance look like to Yah? Our creator took full responsibility, accountability, and the consequence of what we were all going to live. And his version of repentance was hanging on the ancient top in front of us. Turn to us, saying, I forgive you. In Hebrews, it says this, so when Elohim desired to show more convincingly to the hires of his promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath or a covenant. He guaranteed it. Micah knew this. So by two unchangeable things, which it is impossible for Elohim to lie, there are promises made to Abraham here and his descendants. And the author in Hebrews knows this. It's impossible for Elohim to lie. This is what he relates it to. Who have fled the refuge and might have the strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope. The confident expectation of someone, an Elohim who does not lie. We have this as our sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. A hope that enters into the inner place, the temple. The naos, the holy of holies, behind the curtain. When Yeshua has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become the high priest, the atonement for us all, after the order of Melchizedek. Those who would also do this. In Acts 5, 30, 32, it says this, and this is the scene where the Sadducees are arresting the the apostles for their behavior and they're going to throw them in jail and they're actually going to be set free by himself but it says here the elohim of our fathers raised yeshua whom you killed by hanging him on a tree this is interesting what a response they're being treated very very poorly here by the religious system elohim exalted him in his right hand as a leader and savior to give what repentance to israel whoa 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 to give repentance the repentance of elohim to give them his repentance and for the forgiveness of their sins he has taken it all on this and now the question is will we now turn to his repentance to his forgiveness 
And we are a witness to these things. And so to the Holy Spirit of the Ruach and whom Elohim has given to those who obey him. Peter is making this statement to the religious believers. We have to obey Yah now. You people are corrupt. The just weights and scales. And so in his reign that was referred to here by Mike as he came to the end of the chapter, Ezekiel 42, 4, it is very clear. He talks about the building of the walls, the one who is going to administer this final age. In the visions of Elohim, he brought me to the land of Israel and set me down on a very high mountain on which was a structure of the city of the south. So in these last great eight chapters of the prophet Ezekiel, he brings forth the incredible visions of something that is going to take place in this last thousand years. And he brought me there and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like bronze. By the way, go read Revelation, the revelation of your Messiah 115. And his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. Not a great description of a long haired blue eyed hippie, I might add. But nonetheless, with a linen cord and a measuring reed in his hands, he was standing in the gateway. And the man said to me, son of man, look with your eyes. In other words, this is going to happen physically and hear with your ears. It's going to happen physically. And set your heart upon all that I show you, for you were brought here in order that I might show it and declare it to you. Something physically that is going to occur. And the one who's overseeing the building of the walls mentioned by Micah is this vision that Ezekiel is recording. Declare all that you see to the house of Israel. The repentant stored house without guile. Think of this in spiritual terms. Spiritual integrity, faithfulness, trustworthy willing to pay the price, the sacrifice of our own lives, obedient, at least as best as we can, courage and strength, reliable. By the way, this is to him. We're turning to him. And the repentance of God is meeting the repentance of his creation. That we may have that heart circumcision to give to others, to be kind, thankful, humble, and those who will love others and who fear Yah, the reverence of Yah, the reverence of the one who repented to his own creation, who turned to his own creation. The sons of Jacob, the meanings of their name brought out, I couldn't help but mention this here, the house of Israel. You bring them all together in a statement. I just have to read this again because it's so incredible. This is the house of Israel. When you bring the meanings of those names in the order that they are given, it says this, Yah has looked upon my affliction. Yah has heard that I was hated. Now, this time, will my husband be joined to me? Very bridal language. Now I will praise Yah. Elohim has judged me with mighty wrestlings. What good fortune. Happy am I. Elohim has given me my wages. Just scales. Elohim has endowed me with a good gift. Now my husband will dwell with me. You shall add to me. You shall have this son, the just. The great repentance of Elohim. He turned to us, just like Micah said, right at the end of his incredible book that he wrote as this mighty, humble servant of Elohim. And he finishes with woe to me. Woe is me. I am not greater than any of you, yet I must deliver this message. Judgment is coming. Look at this in the Psalm 106, 44, 48. We'll finish here. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. For, this, for their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. Save us, O Yah, our Elohim, and gather us from among the nations. Restoration, repentance on both parties. That we may give thanks to your holy or set apart name and glory in your praise. 
Blessed be Yah, the Elohim of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say amen. Praise Yah. Okay, let's finish there in this book. And we'll, uh, I hope that the book of Micah has blessed you as much as it has blessed me. This great servant of Yah. May we take wisely the lessons that are learned here as we come to the end of the age. And may we hear the words that are so timeless from this mighty, mighty and humble servant of Yah that was given before the time of impending judgment. Amen.